Hello and welcome to Ditching Hourly. I'm Jonathan Stark. Today I am joined by Jason Langsdorf. Jason, welcome to the show. Thanks so much for having me. I feel like the last time we talked was 10 years ago. Can you believe it? It has been a while. That's awesome. Well, I'm looking forward to hearing what you're up to lately and sharing the sort of non-standard paths that you've traveled. Uh, but first, could you, for folks who haven't heard your name before, could you give us a little overview of who you are and what you do? Sure. I am Jason Langsdorf. I am the host of, a, of an online show called Learn with Jason, where I pair program with folks from around the community and uh, learn something new about code every week. And I also am a uh, consultant content creator. So I work with companies to build higher quality media, mostly in the realm of video uh, and mostly in tech. Okay. So uh, just so I understand, what would be the purpose of that for them? Is it kind of like developer relations or content marketing, that kind of thing? Yeah, it's a it's a little bit of both. I think we're we're seeing an interesting shift in the tech industry where, um, especially post COVID, things like conferences just don't have the same return on investment that they had before. You used to be able to, you know, go sponsor a conference and you would see thousands of developers and get a bunch of leads and these days, it, it, not as many developers are going out. I think because of the the pandemic, people are are thinking about their travel more as like, I'd rather go see my friends and family than go to a professional event. So they do remote events and a remote event isn't going to have the same level of interaction. You don't get those those serendipitous opportunities to you know, make a connection, get a lead, get something that's going to convert for your company. So companies are spending tens of thousands of dollars to do this, or if not hundreds of thousands of dollars to go out to these conferences. And in a lot of cases, it's just the the DevRel team from one company talking to the DevRel team from all the other companies. And <laughs> it's, it's just not, it's not the Brutal. same uh, profit center that it was before. Uh -huh. um, and so what a lot of these companies are looking at is how can we make a bigger impact with that that marketing money that we were spending. And in a lot of cases, what they're turning to is video because something like a webinar or other, other types of, you know, zoom based, uh, marketing efforts, they just don't land as much. Everybody's sick of being on zoom calls. Nobody wants to be on yet another video call. So how do you make a video that people want to watch, you know, and that means you're competing with YouTube, with Netflix, with Hulu, you got to go make something that's actually interesting so that people want to watch it. And, and that's where I'm uh, helping companies out. Oh, very cool. Very interesting. Okay. So this, so the reason I reached out was really, I got an email from you and I was like, oh, I haven't heard from Jason in forever. And it was an announcement. I think it was in December mm -hmm. of 2022. Where are we? 2023. Yeah. About this learn with Jason that you're talking about. So yes. what I'm curious, um, well, first, what is that? And mm -hmm. what is the model there? So for people to, you know, just to kind of like give people ideas for novel ways to take their, you know, weird collection of skills and everything and bring them together in a way that creates value for other people in a way that they can, you know, afford to live doing it. But also, well, like, what led you to there? I'm curious about what led up to that other things you had tried and, and maybe experimented with to give people just like a lot of I different ideas for ways that they could mm -hmm. show up in the market. So yeah, so let's start with what is Learn with Jason. Yeah, so so Learn with Jason is a bit of a, a serendipitous discovery for me. I have been doing it since 2018, but when it started, it was actually part of a, a marketing effort for the company I was working at at the time. I was at a company called Gatsby. And so I knew that I wanted it to be my thing, and I knew that I didn't want it to be limited just to what Gatsby was doing. But I also knew that it was going to be a great way for me to, you know, accomplish my my objectives for Gatsby because I was working as like their de facto developer relations team. Um, they didn't have a formal one. I just kind of I saw an opportunity and we were small enough that it was a it was a startup that was like, hey, you see something that needs to do and just go do it. Right. Um, so I, I started trying a bunch of things. Uh, the first format was I I was live streaming on Twitch and I just did anything that we were doing as a company. I would live stream it because I was trying to show transparency. It was an open source based company. So being, you know, being kind of an open book was important. But most of what I was streaming was really uninteresting. We were doing meetings. We were doing, uh, you know, open source governance. And none of that's really, people didn't want to watch that. Hmm. Uh, but then somebody asked me a question and they wanted to learn how to use Gatsby. And I said, would you be comfortable doing this on a live stream? And that felt way better, but it felt 
a little off to me. The power dynamic was wrong because I was, you know, I'm owning the show. I'm also the expert. And I've got this person who already had to like kind of be willing to put themselves out there and ask for help. And now I'm saying, well, you not only like show up not knowing things, but will you do that in front of a live audience? Right. <laughs> right. Right. Um, so I inverted it. And now the way that it works is I go to an expert and I say, hey, will you come teach me the thing that you know? And I'm going to be the person who doesn't know anything. Oh, and cool. it has the the benefit of the show has been that one, I, it's very repeatable because I don't have to do a ton of prep to do the show. In fact, the less prep I do, the more authentic the show is because I'm really asking beginner questions. I'm mm. really learning it for the first time. When I see a feature, I'm actually showing my own genuine excitement or confusion or whatever at how this thing works. Um, and I think that's really made it feel good to watch because you're you're seeing somebody who you know i've been doing this for 20 years and so i think a lot of people would look at me and think ah well once you've been doing anything for 20 years you're clearly an expert you don't have anything left to learn and you know that's for me there are areas where i can do it in my sleep and there are so many more areas where i have no idea what i'm doing <laughs> so i think to somebody who's earlier in their career seeing an expert flail yeah. is something that actually helps make this journey a little less intimidating. Like, oh, well, if, if the experts are still figuring out, like, it's okay that I don't know everything yet. Right? Mm, okay. um, so when I found that format, it really started to resonate and it worked. And since then, I, I did that at Gatsby. When I left Gatsby, I had worked out to keep the intellectual property rights. And so I was able to then take it over to my next job, uh, which was a company called Netlify. Oh, yeah. And they let me keep running the show. And, and there I was able to even work out where they covered the cost of live captioning. So I have a human captioner on every show now. Um, oh, wow. And that turned into a kind of a sponsorship model because other companies were like, oh, well, we want to be involved. So they, they wanted logo placement on the show. And it's got a little lower third. It says what the title of the episode is. And I show company logos. So I have four corporate sponsors now for the show who, who kick in and that helps me cover the cost of the captioner. I've got an admin that helps me book and schedule and run the social media. I've got uh, an editor that helps me clean up the episodes. So their sponsorship helps me run all that um, and helps the show run on autopilot. I, I basically have to do the outreach to get a guest and mm -hmm. the um, actually showing up and doing the show. And otherwise it kind of runs itself. And that's, that's pretty excellent for me Yeah, that because I don't, great. you know, <laughs> not not good at doing lots and lots of uh of like admin work especially when it was on the side it would have my my last job would have made it completely impossible if it wasn't largely mm. automated except for the content itself mm. okay I, I don't know if i said this when i was talking about it but the announcement email is that you're going full-time yes on this so is it is it actually full-time or is it just that it's the only thing you're doing it is actually full-time so i am well I, I've expanded Learn With Jason beyond just the show, so I should I clarify there. Um, okay. What I'm doing is I'm still doing the show. Uh, so there's an episode a week that gets filmed, and that is still run with sponsorship, and, and that covers a significant portion. Uh, it replaces a significant portion of my, my old salary. And then on top of that, I'm also doing solo shows where I do some kind of Q&A, and I'm pulling those out and, and turning them into short YouTube videos. And those are, are sort of my advertising, if that makes yeah. sense. Like I'm trying to reach out to the community, build, build a little bit more of a connection with folks so that they don't have to, their first introduction to me isn't a 90 minute video. Right. Um, these are, you know, two to two to 10 minute videos of something that we talked about, uh, for anywhere from career advice to choosing a, like individual contributor or management or, you know, whatever it is people are interested in. They, they, as long as I've got some relevant experience, they, they'll ask questions and I, I kind of talk through that. Mm. And then I'm also doing these, um, these paid engagements with companies to help create better video content. And that can be something as, as straightforward as, Hey, we want to, we need somebody to build something with our app and teach people how to do it. It's going to be a 10 minute tutorial. And that's, that's something that I can charge for. Or it can be something way more ambitious, like I'm talking to a couple companies about building a full-on reality TV show, because <laughs> for the same cost as throwing a conference, you can actually do a six-episode season mm. of your own TV show, which if you want to do something novel, you want to stand out to, to a developer audience, you know, look around at what people are doing. If you look at the most popular YouTubers, you look at what's selling on Netflix, what people are watching on, you know, all these different networks it's not another interview. You know, it's very rarely an interview. And even if it is an interview, it's an interview that's closer to 
Anthony Bourdain parts unknown or, or what, uh, John Favreau is doing with chef show, you know, the interviews mm. now have something going hot ones where they're eating yeah. hot wings while they talk. It's gotta have, there's gotta be something more to it. You can't just do a, uh, like two heads in a, in a screen and, and think that people are going to pay attention the whole time. Yeah. Um, I agree. Yeah. Just last night I watched, well, this was two heads on a screen talking, but it was Lex Friedman and Mr. Beast. And, mm. And it was just fascinating. You know, he he had a million little, Mr. Beast had a million little suggestions about this, that, and the other. But but he was like, it just boils down to like, like step one, you have to make a great video. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, knowing what that even is, is difficult perhaps, but, right. but it boils down to that. Like, it's not about the thumbnail or the title. Those things have an effect, but they, you can't make a promise that's bigger than the video can deliver on. And, but, and yeah, to your point, it's like, He's like, you can absolutely make a video go viral. It's just a lot of work, right? It's yeah. like, you know, it's a lot of studying. It's a lot of like seeing what works and, and it's not, and it has to be good because if you go back and look at my first hundred videos, they stink. They, they didn't go viral and they shouldn't have. And I can tell you exactly why they didn't. <laughs> so yeah, it feels like video. I mean, it's, it's on the one hand, it's kind of stupid to say it's like video is like a super important medium, but it's, it's, I think, I, I think the vast majority of people, including myself, probably underestimate how important it is and like what this sort of new art form of it. So, you know, perhaps you're the right person to talk to, to this about, but like, you know, the 90 minute, you, you mentioned the 90 minute sort of like tentpole pieces, like the big longer episodes, mm -hmm. but you've also got these kind of clips, right. That you mm -hmm. consider sort of like advertising. So what do you, what do you, are they like stuff you put on TikTok and YouTube shorts and Instagram reels? And like, is it, is it going all over the place or like where, where do people find these? How do people? Find My them? intention is to get them to, you know, TikTok and YouTube shorts and everything for the time being, I'm still new enough to this, you know, I've, I've been doing it, I took December off, right? So I, I left my my full time job at Thanksgiving 2022. I took December off because I had had a lot of pent up stress that I needed to just kind of unwind from. Mm -hmm. And then in January, I started in earnest. So I'm uh, as of today, about six weeks into this journey. And so I'm actually still building a lot of the clips and figuring out what the editing style is and trying to get the cadence right so that they don't feel like one of the things that I'm really worried about is when you go solo, there's this big risk of creating a, a following as opposed to a community. And I worry a lot about putting myself in a situation where what, what my message is, is I know things and you need to know them. Right. And instead, I want the message to be we're all learning things together. And so when you're putting out more content that is that is built around you, it's hard not to to make it a like kind of preachy proselytizing thing. And, and you want it to be more of like learning together. And so a lot of what I'm trying to find are the clips where I'm sharing what I've done wrong. So it's more of like me sharing my experience as opposed to me saying, here's what you should do in your situation. Mm -hmm. um, because I've never, I, that kind of stuff has never resonated with me. And I, I've always liked the idea that you, you know, you don't have leaders, you have, you have co-mentors, you have co-conspirators, you've got community, right? Um, nobody here is, is in charge. We're all just trying to learn how to do this a little bit better. And we've all got tips to share. And, you know, these tips are valuable and like, I'll happily pay people for a tip, but that doesn't make them my, my leader. Right. Yeah. <laughs> right. And so I think that's, but it's a hard balance to strike because you do have to have enough authority that somebody's willing to pay you for your knowledge, but not so much that you come across like you're trying to like, you know, I, no, no shade on Tony Robbins, but like, I don't want to be Tony Robbins. I don't want to mm -hmm. give big motivational speeches to, to packed auditoriums. I just want people to, you know, learn one thing from me and do a little bit better and, and have a little more success. Uh, and hopefully I do enough of that, that companies want to pay me to do it. <laughs> right. That's the, that's really the whole goal here is to, is to just put food on the table and get to do stuff. That's fun. I think when you start building a persona, a persona becomes a little bit of a cage and I don't, I don't like being in a cage, you know, it's, you, then you have to make stuff that fits that niche or everybody starts being mad because you're, well, I thought you were the motivation guy. Oh, I thought, you know what I mean? I'm always like, oh no, I don't. What if I accidentally become the, you know, this framework or that framework or this tool or this philosophy. And then if I try to do something different because my interests shift, I have to rebuild from scratch because right. yeah, I don't know. It's, it's, uh, it's a challenging, it's a challenging balance to strike too, because when you go general, 
also people are like, what are you about? Like, what do you stand for? <laughs> yeah. So, so let's, let's zoom in on that because that's a, that was similar to an upcoming question that I had. So like, who is learn with Jason for right now? What learn with Jason is intended to be is a place for people who work on the web, oftentimes in an intermediate to advanced stage of their career, because I don't do a lot of like day one beginner stuff. Um, a place for them to keep up with what's going on and learn little tips and tricks that'll help them do better and make more informed decisions when they're, they're coming up on new projects. Okay. Um, what I have tried, what I've tried to avoid is making it more niche than that. And I think that works against me a little bit because there are creators who have, have gone way more, uh, structured, like, there's there's this very trendy thing uh, in in web dev right now called TypeScript, and everybody wants to use TypeScript. And so there's folks who've come up and they've been like, I am the TypeScript expert, and they are rocketing past me in terms mm -hmm. of viewership, in terms of you know followers and subscribers. And you know, a part of me is like, dang, maybe I should just niche down and like really pick one of these things and go hard on it. And then the other part of me is like, ah, but I don't really, because like TypeScript is cool now, but will it still be cool in five years? Like my guess is no, because nothing in tech stays cool for multiple yeah, years. years. There's always yeah. a, yeah, you know? Yeah. And so so looking at that, I'm like, I don't want to have to reinvent my whole business every few years. That sounds <laughs> less yeah. fun. Right. <laughs> yeah. That was me at the, when, when mobile, so I got in the mobile wave like day one and mm. day, day one of iPhone era mobile, you know, there was stuff before that you know, Brian Fling and that group, um, mm -hmm. with like WAP, but, but day one, I was like iPhone book, you know, HTML, CSS, JavaScript, then, you know, Ethan coined, uh, responsive web design and all that mm -hmm. stuff. And so when I, when that S curve started to tail off, when SAP had a mobile division and when WordPress was mobile friendly out of the box and all, and, and good, you know, like it started to get a lot less interesting and I was looking around and it was like, next step, what's the next step? Like, do I jump onto the next thing that's coming up the hype cycle, mm -hmm. like blockchain or VR or AI or, you know, like, I'm like, Ugh, do I, you know, but I don't, I was like, wait a second. I, I just, I didn't realize it I, super consciously, but like, I, I just like had lucky good timing and wrote a wave the probably the biggest tech wave there's ever been and do i want to do that again i literally was asking myself like i'm looking at the things i'm like i don't i cared about mobile i thought mobile was the coolest thing i ever saw like when i saw an iphone it was instantly during the keynote like that's what i'm doing from now on it yeah. was 100 percent clear it was no ch i had no choice in the matter but when when that was basically over i mean it was it was mass market and it was just you know there were a million experts and I was looking around, I was like, it's same as you that, that you're saying, I was like, I don't care about any of these. Like they're interesting intellectually, but I don't care. So like, am I going to, you know, bet the farm on a platform specialization and spend the next five or 10 years trying to be like the go-to person for, for blockchain? No. Yeah. So you, you're, you're actually, you're touching on something that I, I think for me has been the secret sauce which is I, I live in the, like the meta and I hate that Facebook rebranded because I, I love like meta commentary about things. And I think the, the meta work about work is the most interesting part. And for me, I could care less about blockchain or react versus angular versus view or whatever the, <laughs> yeah. the, the new debate that everybody is having. What I care about is the the underlying interest in the space. I am I find so much joy in learning about how these things work and like getting from that zero to light bulb moment with a new thing, even if that thing is doomed to be obsolete in six months. I don't care because I'm not building my foundation on a technology. I'm building my technology on or I'm building my foundation on the ability to learn how to learn. And if you can find ways to get better at learning, to find joy in learning, then you will be able to succeed kind of in perpetuity because there's always something new to learn. And if you have fun when something new comes along, then you don't feel like you're, you know, drinking from the fire hose and just getting rolled down the street by it. You, <laughs> you're having a good time. You're, you're kind of riding the wave because 
hey, there's a new thing to learn. I want to figure out how that works. Ooh, there's a new thing to learn. I want to figure out how that works. And all, at all the time, you're kind of building this broad base of skill and intuition and good instincts about what will and won't work because the more you learn, the more you get to see those those trends kind of crest and crash. And you can say like, oh, this feels a lot like all these other things I learned in the past that didn't pan out. I'm going to hold off on going all in on this tech mm-hmm. or whatever the thing is, right? And And I think if... It, maybe if that's the thing that I go in on is like, I'm the, the learn how to learn guy. I'm cool with that. Like that's, <laughs> yeah. that's fine. That feels like that holds for a really long time yeah. and, and meets all of my interests. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's, I feel like you've also found a good spot where, you know, this is clearly something you've, you've been talking about ditching hourly for a decade now. It's more than that. Yeah. 2006. Yeah. So it's, you know, it's it, like, I think it's, Maybe it's not necessarily being resistant to a niche. It's more about finding a niche that that truly is something that you kind of embody, something that you are. Yeah, it, it's easy. I know this is not the this is not common for people to have this happen to them, but they they choose me usually. It's like it's like the kind of thing that comes along, and I can't not obsess about it. And for mm-hmm. me, like. Um, and and there, I can point to like light bulb moments or every phase of my life. I can point to a light bulb moment when it's like I said before, I had no choice in the matter. Like the first time I, you know, when I was 15 or 14, the first time I saw my next door neighbor, Robbie Radigan's electric guitar, I was instantaneously in love and was, you know, paper route money to go buy my own and just wouldn't put the thing down to like my sister down the hall was like homicidal and understandably <laughs> so like me trying to figure out Eddie Van Halen and licks and i couldn't even like play the damn thing um but it was i i remember the exact moment of that i remember the exact moment that i mentioned already that the iphone announcement i watched it live um there have been a, a number of those things and and the, the light bulb moment for me with pricing especially for services and you know uh, service providers was when i was managing a firm and one day I realized that our best developer was probably losing us money and our most junior developer was printing money for us. And I was like, that, no, that can't be. And I puzzled and puzzled until my puzzler was sore. And then I it was like, oh, there's a whole different way to do this that literally no one I know, and I knew a ton of developers, literally no one I knew had ever even considered doing something besides billing by the hour. It wasn't even mm. like the first thought they had was like when they went solo or whatever was like, well, how much should my hourly rate be? It wasn't like, should I build a business on top of the billable hour? Everyone was going to do that. It was just a question of how much to charge by the hour. Right. And, and that just, that just, uh, it, it, it offended me. I was just like, I'm, I need to rid the world of this, this cancer. It was just, it seemed like a mission level thing. And who knows in 10 years, or I guess I'm coming up on 20 doing pricing, maybe something else will choose me and I'll go do something else. But, um, but to your point about the learning to learn being evergreen, it does not that you're looking for advice, but it, it reminds me of when I was doing this sort of fractional CTO thing. I had these, this advisory retainer type of service where I would, where mm-hmm. non-technical companies would be, have this big bet the business project where they needed that we're cutting edge. Uh, early adopter type buyers, you know, like someone who was really forward looking visionary types, you know, managing directors and senior vice presidents of big companies. And, you know, people like that, that were like, this mobile thing is going to be huge. It's going to change everything forever. And they were looking around like, who knows about this stuff? And so I'd get brought in to talk about that stuff and advise them over the course of months. And, and, mm. and I promise I'm getting to a point. Um, the activities that I would generally undertake to keep myself conversant and knowledgeable of, of all of the new things are kind of like what learn with Jason provides as far, you know, I looked at the homepage and it was just like, Oh, if I wanted to learn about, I don't know, Gatsby and auth zero and, and free Firebase or like a bunch of different things, just so I could have from a, from an advisory standpoint, not be an expert at coding with them, but understanding them enough so that, I could do a pros and cons of this versus that for some decision business decision maker, you know, that was basically how I spent my time. I was like, Mm -hmm. you know, listening, you know, doing some feasibility testing on my own and like people be like, Oh, how much can you store in app cache before the phone melts? And, you know, it's like, okay, I might do some testing, but I would also be listening to everything, you know, 
uh, Fert would say and and keep up to date on responsive images from who was that Thomas Fuchs and you know and like keeping up to date with all of these things without doing huge projects with them but just keeping up to date understanding what the value proposition of the technology is what mm -hmm. is the learning curve how many developers can I find it how easy is it to find a developer you know is there an expert I can go to if this blows up in our face and you know things like that so that it, it almost like I could almost see like someone in a CTO kind of position really being or some higher level, you know, senior developer or someone is decision making level in the tech uh, part of the company that needs to keep up to date with all these different things, not because they trying to choose their next shiny object, but because they have to advise people about right. is this thing ready for prime time? Is it a toy? Is it uh, is it actually useful? Is it amazing? when is the right time to use this versus that like react versus angular what what are the pros and cons of it so that's that feels like a really cool space it, it's it's like a non-niche but it there's something there yeah I, I think it's you know the 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 overarching te like tone that i hear in in a lot of web dev and tech in general is this stuff is moving fast. I have no idea what's going on. I don't know how anybody keeps up on this stuff. And then you start hearing the, like, it, you know, then you get the, the really like unhealthy sides of it where you, you've got the people who are like, well, grind, you know, you just got to work through your nights and weekends. You just got to be, you just got to be on this all the time. Like if you're not learning in your free time, do you even care about your job? And I hate that. And then there's the other side of it, which is like, well, if you, you know, if you are, you know, if you don't want to be your job, you just kind of settle in and do your job and, and, you know, don't do anything for free and don't, you know, don't learn anything new unless it's on the clock. And you kind of see people saying like, ah, well, let's just actively not learn because it doesn't matter. It's just a job. And I don't yeah. like that either. I want, I want to find that middle ground where you, you, you know, it's like the learning should be the hobby. If that makes sense. Like I'm not always learning tech. Like I'm also learning a new recipe in the kitchen or I'm learning a new hobby out, you know, like my, my partner does ceramics. Maybe she's teaching me how to do ceramics. Like it's just something I want to learn how it works. How does a kiln work? Why did, why does that even, how did we even discover that right now? I'm down a documentary rabbit hole. Um, yeah, and, yeah. and that kind of stuff is like, that's what keeps life interesting. And that's what keeps life fun. And in tech, I think that if you can find a way to make the the learning and the keeping up part of your like relaxation, part of your your like where you find joy. So you know, instead of turning on Kenji Lopez and watching how to cook, you turn on Learn with Jason and you you learn how other people are are building apps. Right? It's hopefully the same level of entertainment, and you you gain benefit from both of those, but in a way that is entertainment first. Mm -hmm. um, and so I feel like there's there's a lot of opportunity in this space to to teach in a way that doesn't feel like you have a project. Here is how to build your project. Now go build that project. Like, no, let's just passively consume this information and try to build more context. What's happening in the web? Why is it happening? What are the macro trends? Why do people care? Mm -hmm. And, and from there you can start to make more informed decisions about where you would and wouldn't go with your team, with your client's money, with whatever it is. Um, because you actually had, you've built, a broad understanding as opposed to just zeroing in on like this one very technical solution. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so forgive me if you'd said this already, but the, the topics that I'm going to find there, when I just looked at the homepage, the first thing I saw was auth zero, which to me sounds like, mm. but am I also going to see like how to make a chicken vindaloo or is it strictly <laughs> right? So I have, I have played around with doing other things. So there, there are a couple episodes in the archive where I learned how to uh, make music in Ableton Live. Oh, cool. I learned how to uh, how to play Minecraft. I learned a couple things that are a little a little more off the beaten path. Um, I've since stopped doing that. I'm sticking mostly to web, and I have I'm my side my new side hobby project <laughs> is figuring out how to set up uh, a, a kitchen studio because I want to just make a cooking show. Partially for the the fun of learning how to film a, uh, you know, my AV is my new very expensive rabbit hole hobby. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, so part of me just wants to figure out how do you film a show like that? How do you mic somebody so they don't sound like crap? How do you get the light so that you can actually see what's going on? What camera angles do you need? Then the other part of me is like, well, shoot, man, if I make that, then I could go around to all these chefs I love. I live in Portland, which is one of the best food cities in the world. Maybe I can get some of these chefs I love to come into my house and teach me something because I got a show. 
that's right. actually like well filmed and looks good. And, you know, it's a way for them to, to get a little bit more on their, their media reel. Right. Um, yeah, I don't know. I, that's that's kind of like we'll see, but <laughs> yeah, that's that's a challenge. I mean, I'm I, uh, I'm a very utilitarian. Uh, like, I feel like part of my job is almost like I think Gary Vee said he's like think of your think of your business as like a media company, you know, mm-hmm. which you're clearly kind of down that path, yeah. and and it's like oh, when you think about it like that, it does it sort of changes your perspective a little bit because. Uh, it just you just have different you make different decisions and i i try to keep things as simple as humanly possible with that stuff like right now like my camera is set up we're, this is not video so who cares but um but i'm putting together like a little office studio and the same thing and it's like it is it's a daunting task i mean i interviewed someone i think last week or 2 weeks ago whose whole job is setting up home studios like that he was yes. like he has so much fun with it and he's he's got a UX background. He's like a, basically from the dev world, the web world. And he's like, he just does like homestudiomastery.com now. And he just has helps people set up their lights and cameras. And, and so cool. Yeah. And it's like more people. I'm, I'm, it's funny having like you guys basically back to back because like you've got like this good video set up, a really good mic and all that. And the lighting and all the stuff. And it's like, it's like, it feels like maybe... Um, maybe related to work from home COVID era. Like let's it's makes sense to set up the house, have a room in the house. That's kind of set up as a recording studio, which is like, Mm -hmm. like a video studio. It's madness, but it does make sense because if you're going to spend so much time on video. Well, and, and especially if you work in any marketing adjacent role. So, you know, developer relations, I know they get mad when you call them marketing, but (laughs) you know, it's, it, 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 you're making a connection to a community and that involves putting yourself out into a community. If you work in traditional marketing or if you're in any kind of marketing space where you're trying to do social media, you're trying to do webinars, you're trying to just meet with people. Like having high quality audio is such a game changer for the way that people perceive the quality of your service. Right. If you're going to be on video all the time, having a nice camera and a good like backdrop set up so that you look like you're in a cool space and not like against a, a plain white wall, mm-hmm. you know, like that little, that, those subtle differences, they really do just very, you know, in subtle ways, but it's the, um, I don't know if you're familiar with the Adonis effect, which is this, this idea that like, if somebody is perceived to be more attractive, they have a higher likelihood of success because people treat them better. They mm-hmm. like assume the best in them and they're willing to give them more. And mm-hmm. I think that that's true too with presentations. That's why companies spend millions of dollars on logos. That's why companies hire, you know, rock bands to come to their, their company events. It's not because they needed to hire Aerosmith to play their show. It's because somebody said, wow, Salesforce could afford Aerosmith. They must be really successful. Yeah. Right. Like it's that kind of stuff. Right. right. And, right. and so I think it's that, um, I think during the pandemic, a lot of people realized, well, we don't get to go to conferences anymore. We're, mm-hmm. I'm not going to be on a stage anymore. The stage isn't going to do the work. I got to do the work. I need to, I need to present really well. And if I want to look like, you know, a top tier DevRel, it's going to, inc- it's, you know, part of looking like a top tier DevRel is having the top tier camera and the top tier backdrop and the top tier mic, because it makes you seem more polished, even if you're, if you're not. Yeah. It's like, it, I think in the, it, I can't remember where I heard it, but it's probably the interview. Uh, the previous interview was like, it, it's like, you would have gotten you would have thought about your outfit probably if you were going to go to a conference to present on stage, mm-hmm. you probably would have thought about it. This is like your new outfit. Like it's since you're yes. not going to go in person, it's like your backdrop, it's everything in your space. It's the whole environment that's getting captured. Um, yeah. It's, it feels like it's fascinating. I, it, I was, I've wondered if like it will change the way that I wonder how far the effects will go. Like, will it go into architecture? Will like the average, you know, United States starter home have a video room, Right. Like that would be wild instead of a TV room. You know, it's like, I I do think we are seeing like, um, so, and this is a real interesting kind of uh, maybe apocryphal tidbit, but I heard that a lot of the reason that open format kitchens became so popular is because everybody was building their kitchens based off of what they were seeing on TV and open format kitchens are way easier to film in 
So they were choosing the open format to allow for like camera and light placement, mm. but people were seeing those. So they thought they were better kitchen. So they started architecture changed to become more open format by defined. Yeah. And, and that to me is really interesting because that would imply the same thing. We're going to start seeing more and more people have a studio room in their house when we see them on TV. Mm -hmm. So people will start thinking, Hey, I should add that. Right. Mm -hmm. So now instead of people getting the, you know, the bonus garage, they'll get the bonus like studio office. Yeah, exactly. That like soundproofed and has a door. So, mm -hmm. right. Cause that, that, that was another thing. It's like open format homes show seem to show or for the past, maybe 10 years, it seemed like that's like a, you know, when the house in our neighborhood gets flipped, what's the first thing they do? Knock down some walls. Right. And right. That's the last thing you want when you're working from home though. You need like, especially if you have kids and dogs and so forth. It's like, no, exactly. you need like as soundproof as possible. Yeah. It is fascinating to, to imagine not just life imitating art, but, but like the utility of a home changing after, or you could imagine even in an apartment building, you could imagine there being like almost a co working, like as an amenity, a conference mm -hmm. room or like something that you would book out that, that was in the building instead of like a gym nobody uses or, or right. whatever, you know, as a sort of fascinating thing to, feels like a potential trend. I think it's, I, I'm, I can't imagine it doesn't happen. Right. You know, we're, it's, we're seeing more and more co-working spaces come out. And, you know, I, I know that personally, if I ever find a way to make enough millions that I can build commercial properties, like I have a whole plan around building something like that, a little, you know, basically a community center that would be co-working and living and, and retail and all the things you would need to do all of the things that a modern worker that's basically online would want to do in a space that you theoretically would never have to leave, you know, mm. kind of like the, like the New York city style. Like you can live your whole city, your whole life in eight square blocks and never, you know, never have to leave. Yeah. Can you do that in a city that's not New York? I think you can. Yeah. Potentially. I mean, that was where we were was going, wasn't it? Like we live mm -hmm. and all of that. So, uh, Oh, that's right. They were doing that. Yeah. That was, that's the vision. It was funny. Cause earlier when you, when you first were, when you were talking about, um, uh, community, not followers or, or community, not audience. Mm -hmm. I was like, Oh, I'm like co-working space 2024. Here it comes. <laughs> and then sure enough, it's already on your mind. Cool. Well, what, what it's still early days here. You know, you said it's only been six weeks of you like doing this in earnest, but what is, what is, what is the, how does it feel? Like, does it feel like there's traction for this? There's legs like you're, you're not to get into money too much, but I, I you know, from a business standpoint for someone what does the transition path look like for someone who's just like sick of typing semicolons and, and is comfortable on a mic, on a camera and, and enjoys that stuff feels like it's not a problem for them. Like what, what have you seen people do beyond just yourself? What have you seen people do that creates value for people who are willing, you know, for clients who are willing to pay for that kind of an assist? I mean, we, we've seen the, the path of like YouTube or Instagram influencer becoming a, a career. And there are a lot of folks who, who do that in, you know, makeup, fashion, uh, food all over the place. Right. And, and it's starting to happen in tech. And there are a handful of folks that I know who make their full-time living off of, off of content creation. So there's, uh, Anya Kubo, there's James Quick, there's, um, a, a few others that are like who could, but you know, they also run other companies and stuff. And what I found is with learn with Jason, I've been, I've been building it slowly since 2018. So, you know, we're almost five years into this journey and I probably waited two years too long to go solo on it because I've already, I've <laughs> already beat my 2022 salary at the end of January. <laughs> Wow. So I, uh, Hello. it was, it was very much like a, um, when I let people know I was ready, I, it felt like a lot of folks were like, finally, God, we've been telling you to do this forever. <laughs> um, and so that, that worked out really well in my favor, whether or not that's going to be like an initial spike that hardcore bottoms out. I don't know yet. Uh, early signs show that I, I do think this is sustainable at a level that lets me keep the lifestyle I had in my full-time job. And, uh, you know, the, the rates that I'm able to charge are, you know, it's, it's, it's expensive to make these videos and, and people are willing to pay to do it because, mm -hmm. you know, even if you do have a, a great, like a world-class developer relations team or a marketing team, you don't always want the messages to be coming from inside the house. 
And a lot of times there's much more benefit in getting a lot of creators to make something small about mm -hmm. your thing than to have your internal team making tons and tons of content because there's a saturation point that I think is pretty low mm -hmm. where after a certain point, you see the same person with the same message. You go, oh yeah, that's the person who always says that thing. And you're, you're not like hearing the message anymore. It's just sort of like brand reinforcement. Yeah. And so if you want lots and lots of people to be talking about the thing. And that's what folks like me are offering is, is, you know, I'm doing this for myself, just stuff that I'm learning and having fun with. And also if companies are trying to get somebody to use their stuff, like my model is you, t you hire me and then I will build something with your stuff. I'll talk to you. I'll talk to you about the scope to make sure I'm using the features that you want showcased, but you don't get like, they don't get code review. They don't get final editing or yeah. anything. It's, it's very much like a, it's not a paid review kind of thing. It's more of like a paid build. Um, and yeah. so they just, they're basically tossing me the topic and that's what they pay for is to prioritize their tech as a topic. Mm -hmm. Yep. But it's a, it's a very lucrative space to be in for somebody who is comfortable, you know, comfortable on camera, comfortable teaching, um, capable of breaking down a, a complex topic into something that lets somebody go from zero to light bulb. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and I, you know, I don't know, I, I'm not sure what the requisite experience is here, right? Because my, my path was very strange. I started out as a musician I was a performer. Um, I, you know, I've always had an interest in like education and, and kind of team stuff. So I looked into a lot of like how to communicate ideas, how to, how to get people to understand things. So I've read a lot of books around that space. Um, so I do, you know, it's, it's clearly something that I've studied and, and that I've put a lot of work into getting good at, but I don't know that it's exclusive to having that knowledge. Like, I think it's something that if you, if you enjoy doing it and you mm. are willing to, you know, put in the work to get it done, it's more of like the price point is more attached to your viewership than it is to your like specific level of skill. Mm -hmm. Because if you look around at the people who make money for making videos, it is not all top quality stuff. A lot of it is just somebody has been doing it for so long that they have a huge follower count and the videos they put out are kind of trash, but millions of people see them. And so they get, they get the paid, you know, the paid engagements because they want the, the viewership. Mm. So, so yeah, a couple of points that you brought up there that, that triggered a thought for me. So the first one was that, you know, the message coming from inside the building, mm -hmm. um, I've been on a couple of webinars for a product that I will not name, but you know, they have, they do tons of these training videos and webinars and stuff like you can ask questions. They're actually live and, and they get me every time. Like I, I'm like, there's this particular thing I want to do with the software. I'm not naming it because like every single time they fake me out. It's like this, this video is going to be exactly what you've been looking for. And I go on and it's the same rehashed, uh, bad docs. It's them reading through essentially what the the bad documentation is mm -hmm. and showing, and you can click here and there's a keyboard shortcut and it's like Apple K and you can, it's like, Oh my God, this is not what you said it was going to be. Or at least, or at least it's so one oh one. Right. It's too, it's too basic. It's just like brand new intro to the product and like click over here and that's where all your files will live. And it's like, okay, this was not, this was pitched as for a specific person who's a specific type, who is trying to accomplish this specific task with this tool that can do a million things. And they showed right. me a million things. And I'm like, I'm like, it's so annoying. I wish there was someone out there. It probably is. I haven't really looked, but I wish there was someone outside of the product who actually understood the needs of it, it knew less about the features and more about the needs. You right. know what I mean? And just like, well, and I, yeah, I don't care if this is the best way to get it done. I just want to know a way to get it done. Yes. Someone show me that, please. <laughs> I think a, a space that I've been looking at a lot for inspiration, sort of serendipitously because it's one of my rabbit hole hobbies, but in the space around video editing and creation, there are so many niche creators there who like, there's this creator named Casey Ferris, who's effectively made his entire YouTube career on teaching people how to use DaVinci Resolve. He does not work for Blackmagic. So, so DaVinci Resolve is a, a editing suite, kind of like Adobe Premiere or, or ScreenFlow or whatever it is you use. Mm -hmm. um, and Blackmagic is the parent company that makes camera gear and that editing suite. And they don't, I think they might pay him a little bit now, but he just was like teaching people, here's my editing flow. Here's how you do this one really annoying thing. Hey, have you ever wanted to do animated text? Here's how I do it. 
And he's one of dozens of people who are making what I assume is pretty close to a full-time living doing these types of videos because they're just very clearly showing their workflow and like they overcame this problem and they, you know, here's what I was trying to do and I couldn't figure it out. So I figured it out. Here's a video that shows you how to do it. And it's, it saved these companies. I don't think they have a, an official DaVinci Resolve like right. tutorial center. Right. They just, you know, they just, oh, well, look at YouTube. It's way it. better than what we yeah. would do. Right. <laughs> yeah. It's so much better for when a creator is describing how they use the tool than like the person who made the tool describing all the features of the tool. It just and, and if you watch the strategy now for a lot of these companies, so uh, uh, talking further about DaVinci Resolve, they release this specialized piece of hardware that's uh, it's like a keyboard for editing. And it's got a bunch of shortcut keys on it that are specifically mapped to their software. Mm -hmm. And I, I'm sure they made promo videos in house, but what they did that was really smart was they sent one of these to all their top YouTube creators. And they said, Hey, we would love it if you would try out this flow or that flow. And they'd kind of suggest like the things that they wanted them to give a shot. And then all these people tried it and put out videos on how to do certain workflows using this new tool. And that led to me buying one because I saw somebody say like, dang, this made me way faster than I thought it would. And I was like, well, that's good because I need to shave some time off of how, how I'm editing these videos It's taken me forever. Right. Um, and it was, you know, just little things like that. You see somebody do it and it's not like, the DaVinci Resolve team saying like, in our new speed editor, you can do X, Y, Z. It's somebody saying like, okay, here's how I used to edit. It was like this. It took me a long time. Here's what I do now. Do you see how much faster that is? I was like, oh, okay. I've seen myself do that. And I've seen that be slow. I want to be fast. Mm -hmm. And then I, and then I go out and adopt the new tool or change the way that I work. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm sure that, you know, black magic, they could maybe budget I don't know, a million dollars to get a bunch of like internal media folks to go make all these things, or they could send less than half of that out to this suite of creators Yeah, and just say like, Hey, we'd love it. If you try this, Hey, have you ever considered trying this? You know, wh whatever it is. And they get all that training for free right? with a higher impact rate. Yeah. So the, 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 I think it takes a little bit of a savvy buyer to mm. not or maybe even a savvy CMO to not view that as like, um, we're not controlling our brand. You know, we're not controlling our brand message oh, or our brand yeah. voice, you know, and it's like, they want to have like lockdown control over anything that's perceived as, um, you know, from them. But, but, mm -hmm. but like what you just described is my experience as well. It's like so much more compelling, you know, these sort of review videos or whatever, if you look at somebody reviewing mics or reviewing Ableton Live or anything like that, it's like, I don't want to see the, I might look at the video that's on the Amazon post for it. And it's just, it's like no voiceover music, you know, almost fetishize the design of it. And, but you don't <laughs> learn anything. It's just not that useful. And I suppose there's right. a, there's a place for both. I mean, Apple certainly does a good job or, you know, in the Steve Jobs era, at least it does a really good job with that. Um, but the, so the other thing that, so I, I feel like we're going to geek out on, on, <laughs> on like content marketing, but if we let's switch, let's switch to something, um, that's also been on my mind. I don't know how, if the, if you've had, um, a lot of people in your audience or community or people that just that, you know, in your network that have been sort of victim of the wave of tech layoffs. And mm -hmm. then, and then if someone there is just like, especially, you know, I don't know if this is true or not, but it seems like I have heard that like more senior people that were laid off were kind of like taking their time. They get severance a couple of months. They're taking their time deciding what they're going to do next. And a lot of them are thinking, um, maybe this would make sense to me, are thinking about just not going back to full-time employment and being like, ah, oh, I'm going to do something different. Um, uh, probably a lot of people, I know when executives get laid off, a lot of times consulting is kind of like a bridge to the next gig, or maybe they decide to keep doing it. I could imagine a lot of tech people, um, just freelancing or consulting mm -hmm. based on the expertise that they gained out of Google or Netflix or whatever. Uh, but it's, I, I love talking to you about this perhaps different path where you were in the house and now you're out and you've got this, mm -hmm. it's like pretty serious credibility. If you like worked on the Gmail team or something like that, and, sure. and now you're doing like productivity videos around Gmail, like I'm going to listen to you, but mm -hmm. you know, but but probably, and probably it will be better just by virtue of the fact that you're uh, also a user and you're not like 
you know, Larry and Sergey didn't have to sign off on this video or like, you know, spend a, a $50,000 or $500,000 on the production of it. Um, I wonder, I wonder how many people are out there that maybe listen to this show that were thinking about going solo anyway, otherwise they wouldn't be listening to the show. They're thinking about <laughs> going solo anyway, and they hadn't made the decision and then the decision was made for them. Right. Um, if this is a path, what, what's the getting started here? What's the one-on-one of this? Like, what's the, do you, maybe you've already had a YouTube channel or, you know, what it, you know, is it a podcast? Is it a, is it a YouTube channel? Is it Instagram? Like, what do you, what, like, what's your gut? I know this is an impossible question to answer, but. So I think I, I it, it's an impossible question to answer with like specific tactics, but I think it's a very, a very easy question to answer in the abstract. Okay. Um, each of us has things that we're doing right now for free because they're fun. Mm -hmm. And there is a high likelihood that the, some of those things are correlated with what you do for money. So for example, I have always been a, a web developer. That's been my trade since I was, since I failed as a musician. <laughs> and um, along the way, I wanted to find ways to pull what I liked about being a musician, a little bit of performance, a little bit of creation, um, just kind of, you know, playing. And I wanted to pull that back in. So I would do things like, you know, joke around on Twitter, or I would do a conference talk, or I would make a tutorial or whatever it was, right? And I found that those things were fun for me to do. They help scratch the itch of being creative, of being a bit of a public performer. And they also helped me advance my career because it was a thing that I could do that like showed my expertise, helped me leverage into a better job, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so I think everybody has those things that they do, they just, they, they're choosing to do it already. And there's probably a place that you're doing okay already, whether it's, you know, you're a great Instagrammer and you, you are consistent there and you've got a good following or whether you're on TikTok, on, on YouTube, whatever it is. And if you've already figured out a place that allows you to, to play, then you have a bit of an inkling of like what your media choices are, your media preferences are. Mm -hmm. And you know, you can just dig into that and try to figure out what it is. What what could you try here? Is it teaching? Is it uh, is it demos? Is it you know? Are you are you going to be like uh, Cassidy Williams in the tech scene? Is is really really good at making like funny videos? She just kind of teases tech in a way that's really like fun and not mean. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I think that, you know, that's allowed her to become an MC at like every company's event. They want Cassidy because she's funny. <laughs> and that's become like a great, I think if she wanted to, she could go full time on that sort of like public engagement. Um, she's a CTO, so she doesn't need to, but uh, <laughs> she, but there are so many people who have like varying skills and, and a lot of folks, I think they, they dismiss the skills they have because they think of them as like, well, that's just a fun thing. Like that's not a job. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And if if you look at what I do for money, it makes no sense at all. <laughs> like I am building a like right now. I am building an app where you can put reactions on pictures of dogs, and <laughs> and like you know you you can put a heart emoji or like the begging eyes emoji. And like this is a this is the thing that I built for work. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm going to teach people how to build it. And somebody's going to pay my mortgage because of that. <laughs> right. And, and like, it's, it feels absurd. And, and, you know, a while back I got to go bring a bunch of my coworkers to a warehouse in San Francisco and make one of them eat cake with her bare hand because it was a, like for a gag in this commercial that we were making. Right. You just get to do this silly stuff. I got to dress up another one of my coworkers as a robot. Like it's all ridiculous. It's all, it, none of it makes any sense. And it would be so easy for me to write this off as like, well, that's not serious. That's not really a job. Yeah. But I have it to is. hate it. It's, I have to hate it, my work. It has to be a yeah. drag. It has to be, hard and busy and stressful it's like exactly yeah and and so i think if you if you get creative and you think about what do i know and what do i like there's probably an overlap in that venn diagram yes and you can find a way to do the thing you like about the thing you know in a way that can make you some money and i think that's the you know that's really the the trick to start looking at and even if it's not instant like for me this this really did it took probably three years of being consistent as a creator before i could have gone uh full time. And it, it mm -hmm. ultimately took me, I think 
like seven years of being a creator before I went full time mm-hmm. uh, of being a serious creator. Like I've been creating stuff since the, the mid two thousands, but I, you know, I, yeah. I wasn't serious. It was really intermittent. Right. Right. So being steady, it was, you know, it was a, a minimum five years before I could have done this full time, but I knew it's where I wanted to go mm-hmm. and I know where I want to go from here. And it sounds ridiculous, you know, making a cooking show in my own kitchen or whatever it is, but (laughs) I see the bridge from where I am to how to get there. I just have to go build it. Right. And so continuing to show up, continuing to do the work, making sure that I'm putting myself in the way of opportunities that let me do stuff that gets me closer to the big production and being able to understand how to shoot something in my own kitchen and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. You know, you can take those incremental steps. And if you have to take a little, like I took a, uh, uh, I was an executive that took a bridge consulting contract and. That's how I made myself confident that I could leave. Um, and if I needed to take a couple more of those while I got my feet under me, I would have, you know, and if, if things ever take a downturn and I can't get people to, to pay for media, I'm 100% going back to freelance or consulting or something like that because I've got that set of skills I can fall back on. Yeah, that's I'm a just, good way to look at it, right? Yeah, I'm fortunate enough that I'm able to do this thing that I love as my primary with a ton of fallbacks if, if something isn't working out. Hmm. Man, that's awesome. So I know I'm looking at the clock. I know we have to wrap up, but uh, this has been great. I hope that people are sort of inspired to think outside the box about (laughs) how they might want to pay their mortgage and that it might not need to be torturous and stressful and long hours and uh, it could be fun. It could feel like goofing around Uh, as long as you're delivering value. It doesn't need to be a struggle. Yes. And like, if you start to do something and you're getting paid and you're having fun, don't look at that as a warning sign. Like, look at that as the reward. Yeah. Cause I have so many friends who, who have started doing something and they're like, man, I love my job. When's the other shoe going to drop? When yeah. is this going to suck again? It's like, no, 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 no. Hold on. It doesn't have to, <laughs> right. You can have a, you can do things for work that feel like play. That is an option. Yes. Right. Yeah. Especially for people in this space. I think it might, not, that might not be great general advice. I'm not sure. But for well, people, I, yeah, you know, <laughs> I have my own limited sphere of experience, right? <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, it's a little caveat there. But anybody listening to this, I think that's good advice for. So, um, well, cool. Where can people go to find out more about what you're up to? Um, the easiest place to find me is I have one of those link pages. So if you go to jason.af slash links, Jason. I've got yeah. all of my my different uh, places that I hang out on the Internet. Perfect. That's awesome. Well, thanks again. It's great to catch up, and we should probably not wait 10 years until the next time. <laughs> Very much agreed. Thanks so much for having me. All right, folks. That's it for this week. I'm Jonathan Stark, and I hope you join me again next time for Ditching Hourly. Bye. <laughs>